awesome. Uh, all right, I'm here to talk about sandboxing and uh, my work in it. I am actually working on two projects related to sandboxing. Um, the first one is called XG App, which is an actual app that your distro will have eventually. It will let you run sandboxed apps. It does installation, updates, and actually runs the thing. And in a very real sense, it's comparable to RPM or dpackage, although it does something completely different. But, uh, the other side is the game SDK, which is, well, it has multiple parts, but one part is the binary release, an upstream binary release of GNOME that you can use to make apps. Uh, but it also involves just making our platform work in a sandbox fashion like adding APIs and supporting it in the shell and whatnot. So I have two major goals in this work. And one of them is sandboxing. And sandboxing is, on a high level, very obvious. You want the app to do, be able to do less. And in particular, not do bad things, whatever that means. But I also want to revolutionize <coughs> deployment and distribution of desktop apps on Linux. So I want upstream to be able to do a binary release of their thing and immediately everyone on every distro and every version of every distro should be able to use it. And if, if it should, they should be able to delete it and it should not have messed with your system. <coughs> so the talk is about sandboxing but it kind of doesn't make sense if I don't start explaining how the deployment stuff works. Uh, the distribution side, we're using something called OS3, which perhaps more people are, are, are aware of. It's a kit like system for large trees of operating system binaries. It's usually used for full operating systems. In fact, the, the GNOME continuous system uses it for, for testing. But we use it for, um, for the apps. Uh, you don't actually have to know much about it, but in the end, an installed app is a checkout of an OS2 repository into a regular directory of files. So here's a, a, an example minimal application. It's just a hello world thing. So it's a directory with a certain structure. There's a metadata file that has configuration options for the app. Uh, there's a bunch of files that are the thing your app will require at runtime. So we would see a, a binary, some, bu some bundled libraries, and some text, some, some data that your app will require at runtime. There's also a separate directory called export, and everything that goes in there is exported to the system when the app is installed. So these three examples are typical things you see exports. It's the desktop file and the icon, so that you can show your installed app in, in the shell and whatnot. And then there's the uh, debug service file, so that you can implement services, which is particularly important as we're moving towards debug activated desktop files. You could conceivably have other things here, like a uh, Dome shell search provider thing, and similar things. Basically, this gets exported, uh, and then we have the XTG directory thing put into this directory. So everything should pick it up by default. Here's the, uh, an example minimal metadata file. It has a name, uh, and the name is actually the, we call it the app ID, but it's the same as the name of the desktop file, it's the name, uh, same as the DBus name, and, and it's the same as the actual application name. A command is what we run when we start the app. And the runtime is, is kind of a dependency on something that the app needs to run. And, and here's a minimal runtime that are very similar to an app. Uh, this one is super minimal, has a shell and libc and the dynamic linker. A uh, more standard runtime would have a lot of libraries in there. X libraries, dbus, a bunch of standard stuff, and also probably shared 
data, like themes and icons and fonts, things that you expect everyone using this runtime, or mostly everyone, to use. It's very similar, it doesn't have the exports because you can't run it. So here, here's the command to run this and install it. Um, at some point you install, you define the remote as some URL to your repository. And then you can install runtime, install app, and then you just run it. And magic happens. It printed hello world, could you imagine that? So under the covers, we're using something called file system namespaces. And they're kind of weird and new, but I, I, I like to describe them in terms of root. A lot more people are aware of what a root is. Take like a subdirectory or a mount or something and you shoot into it, pretending that the root is actually in this subdirectory. File system namespaces are very similar. Except instead of a subtree, you get your own tree. So you, you, you can completely define how the file system looks inside your app. And we do this, and then we put the, the, the runtime files in slash user, and your app files in slash app. And then there's this bunch of scaffolding to make things work. It's not very interesting, it just needs to be there. The interesting part is this, this directory, is always always available, always writable. It's where your app is supposed to put its data. Uh, it's in your home directory, but that does not necessarily mean your actual home directory. It's just the same pad name. Although even your actual home directory it will be in this position. I'd like to talk a bit about runtimes because people have all these expectations. Something is called dependency, and people get confused, they think it's packages. And runtime is really no different from an app. It's just a split. The files could as, could as well be in the app in the app itself. In fact, if you move all the files from the runtime to the app, it probably wouldn't work. So if anyone can make a runtime, but the question is more who should. The reason we have the split, I mean, the reason you have a split in terms of packages is, is a technical reason. You want to have some way to describe the minimal requirements. But the reason we have this split is for ownership reasons. You want different people to maintain the two things. Because one is core complicated distro-like thing, which is the runtime, and we want to share the work in maintaining it and releases, bug fixes, and testing, and, and we want to make the app developers do none of that, because we want the right people to do it. So we want as few runtimes as possible, because they're hard. Uh, and I imagine, I mean I can know, that the way I imagine things will play out is that we have two kinds of runtimes. We'd have the native ones, like I created the GNOME SDK, also a free desktop platform SDK, <coughs> which are very useful if you're an upstream and you want to release your app as a sandboxed app. It's all about sandboxing, it's all about doing all the stuff that XTT app lets you do. <coughs> and, and it's likely that your app changes to work in this, at least if it's supposed to run in a sandbox fashion. But I also imagine there will be a bunch of transitional runtimes where you basically take an existing set of packages and pick some subset of it, call it a runtime. So maybe you would have the Fedora runtime. And then you can take all the other packages in your distro and make apps from those. So you just bundle whatever packages were not in the runtime in the app, and then bang, you have a bunch of apps. Obviously, these apps will not be changed, so they will not be sandboxed to use any of the new APIs. But it's still extremely useful. Not being sandboxed makes it slightly less likely that they work across distros because they might be reading stuff from your file system or whatnot. 
But in practice, most apps probably works across distros, across versions of distros. So this is, could still be very useful. So back to sandbox. Unix isn't Windows. We're already secure, aren't we? Why, why, why do you need the sandbox stuff? I mean, I, I update my machine. It's, it's always secure. Well, maybe I don't always update, but historically. Unix security is all about users. You have a server that has often shared users, and you want to protect users from each other. You want to protect the system and the administrator from the users so that they can't own the rocks or attack another user. And generally, there's a single source or maybe two sources of software that you run on a machine. Basically, you have your distro, which you trust 100% because you're in the background <coughs> doing updates that run scripts as root on your machine. So your distro owns your machine. <coughs> and maybe you're running Oracle or something, but that's just a limited set of software that you run. But in these days, that doesn't quite match the desktop use case. You're generally one user on a laptop and you're the administrator. I mean, you're not logged in as the administrator, but you're the guy taking care of everything on your machine. And you want to install random stuff. Someone tells you about this new game that's supposed to be really hot. You just want to download it and run it. Not necessarily have it run scripts as root on your machine, but you just don't want to run it. So what we really want in terms of security <laughs> is to protect the user from the apps. And this is not something that Unix historically has done at all. And by user, I generally mean the user's data and the user's identity. So if you don't want, your, if you don't want the game to read your email, or pretend to be you on Facebook or something, so you, want, so you want the apps to have less access to your stuff. And you also want to be able to run some app that someone says is cool without having to have this deep trust in whoever provided the app. And if the app sucks, you should be able to remove it and not have it affect anything on your system. And also, in some sense, we want to make it hard as possible for viruses and botnets and all that kind of bad stuff. So what kind of attack vectors does an app have on you? The easiest one is to read your files. You have your, some some things might be encrypted, but most things are not. Right? You can read your email pretty easily and all that stuff. But since we're using file system names, this is, it's very easy to just not let your app see any of your files. So you just don't make that visible by default. There's a bunch of traditional Unix security holes involving set UID and things like that. We avoid that by using nuts. No secret set UID mounts. We use no exec when possible. And uh, there's also this weird process flag thing we set that basically neuters a lot of privilege escalation bugs. Many apps should never read the network. Read from the network. Um, I mean, some will. I mean, if you're running a web, a web browser or an email client, you expect it to run through the network. But, but if you're running a game, a single player game, it should just not have access to the network. And there's this thing called network namespaces that lets us do this. So right now, in the XDG app, you can either have full access to the network or no access. And no access means it looks to you as if there's no internet card at all. <coughs> we also don't want your process to mess with other processes. You could send signals to them, send messages, trace them, and things like that. So there's something called PID namespaces, where we pretend as if your processes are, are the only ones visible in the system. You can't even see any of the app. You can't even see 
like host stuff like the real internet or anything like that. There's also an IPC namespaces that give you a uh, your own copy of all that's uh, global in IPC, your own set of shared memory names and things like that. You also see groups to group things so you can limit like their memory and other processes and things like that. Also, it's very useful to give you an identifier for a process. So you give the C group a name that you can map back to, to the app name. And we use something called user namespaces to basically map every user but yourself to nobody. So if only your user is visible, you don't even know about other users available in the system. We expose very little hardware because that's generally attackable if you have a hardware attack. Either you can use it to get to the kernel or you can like spy on you with your webcam or things that are generally bad. So so the device knows we have our minimal, we have a device, a terminal, dev zero, but none of the actual hardware devices. We have a read-only sys and a limited proc that you can tweak any of the knobs that are global. It's not possible to attack the kernel though, because the kernel is shared, has a shared uh, syscall API with, with everything in the system, so if there's some kind of exploit in your kernel, it's probably possible to use that to, to get out of the sandbox. This is a very hard problem to solve. We're using something called SecComp, which let us filter out certain syscalls. Uh, so we, for instance, we limit use of socket types. So you can't use Apple Talk or any other weird things that are there. So if there's any box in those, at least we filter that out. But if there's a general kernel bug, then we use host. So it's actually, it's actually very easy to set up a sandbox. The hard part is doing something in the, in the sandbox, right? So you can compute and print results. That's not very useful. So we need to have a way to shoot, who, shoot holes in the, in the sandbox. But it has to be the right holes. We can't just have random holes in it. So there's a way in XTG app for apps to request a less harsh sandbox. And uh, right now, they always, uh, apps always get what they want. But the idea is that you have some kind of UI when you install this app once full network access, are you okay with that? And then you could either not install the thing or override its requirements. So we have a network na namespaces that lets you not uh, give you network access. You have to opt in to have network access. Uh, you can opt in to have IPC, not have IPC namespaces because that will allow you to use hex shared memory, for instance, which is kind of useful for performance reasons. You can opt in to have the VRI device nodes. Uh, those are supposedly safe, but who knows, it's hard for it to be tricky to make sure that drivers are safe. You can opt in to have file access to your files. Uh, all of them, or just the directory, or just your home directory, or just your documents, or your music files. Things like that. And there's also a bunch of built-in services that we are able to grant access to. The first one is X11. So X11 has this uh, socket inside temp, which is how you connect to it. So all we do is bind out that socket into the box, and now you can talk to uh, the X server, and then you can do anything, because X is horribly, horribly insecure. I have this sample here. I don't know if anyone can guess what it does. I can demo it. Does this thing also work? Yes. Awesome. So I can run this and it types evil. Oh, no. So, 
Um, I'm sure you can imagine even more evil things to do. Um, it just looks for all the terminals and uh, prints stuff in it. It will probably find your root shell or your sudo available terminal and do really weird stuff. So basically, we, we can't ever. Oh. We can't ever use X and pretend to be sandbox. Uh, but it's very useful because uh, basically all desktop apps on Linux use X. But we have this new thing, Playwin. It's very similar. That's a uh, single socket file you mount into the sandbox. It's in a more modern location in slash run. But the cool thing is that the guy and the protocol is based on this use case. So there's no way for any client to see any other client or any of their resources. In fact, it's really, really hard, impossible almost to, to even have a window being a parent of some other parent, we have to fix the protocol to allow that. Um, so this is the future. Uh, we're getting there, slowly. Um, I guess Fedora 22 might have a useful way of the... For sound, we use using Pulse Audio. Uh, it's very similar, there's a socket you mount, you can uh, connect to it and then you can play uh, sounds. But you can also record from your microphone, and it turns out you can also listen to all the other streams from the other apps, and you can load plugins into the server and all sorts of weird stuff. So we're looking at making that a bit more safe. I think Vim is looking at that. Uh, so maybe that would work eventually, and it would be uh, possible to limit you. I think it should be safe for an app to be able to produce sound, but you have to have extra privileges to be from microphones and you should never be able to load plugins into the daemon. <laughs> we also have the dbus session bus. It's very important in particular because we use uh, it for uh, activation in modern desktop files. Uh, but it's also kind of an open hole. So we only expose a filtered view of it. Uh, whenever you start uh, the app is also start to use a space proxy that filters all your dbus messages and applies a policy. And the policy uh, is the same kind of format as the kdbus policy format, so uh, eventually we'll switch over to kdbus, at least where, where it's available. And, and the default permissions is that you can own your own app ID on the bus and subnames of that, and you can talk to the bus itself. Uh, but nothing else. In fact, you don't even see any of the names that you're not allowed to talk to. It's like you're alone on the bus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. However, if anyone else talks to you, you can send one reply back to that message. So there's a flag in the message like, is this, is, is this supposed to have a reply? And if, if it's that set, you're allowed to send that. Optionally, you can ask for full access if you're just wanting to run some non-sandbox app. And the same with the system bus. We don't actually filter that because I don't think it's highly useful for desktop apps. It's mostly useful for, for the shell itself and the desktop. But we have an opt-in for that. Um, you also probably want to have access to webcams and video streams. There's this new project that Pim is working on, Pinos. Uh, another all similar to Pinos. <laughs> um, it's similar to Pulse Audio, but it's for video. Actually, it has some audio too, because they're often combined. Uh, I, I don't have uh, this integrated in the uh, XDG app yet, but I will add that so that you can basically uh, <coughs> allow you some access to a specific webcam or something like that. So in this kind of setup, what would a good sandboxed, proper sandbox app look like? You probably still don't want it to read your files, because that's like this major open hole. So you still have your per app writable directory, 
you have Wayland access to, to, to do graphical output and user input, and also do sound output support. And you have a, a tightly filtered session bus access, and possibly network access depending on what kind of app you are. Still kind of hard to do anything. I can imagine <laughs> writing a game on that kind of setup, but not a uh, read desktop app. So at the Hackfest, the developer experience Hackfest a couple of years ago, we came up with the idea of a portal. And portal is, is not super well defined. It's a name for a design where you have a service that extends what a sandbox can do in a safe fashion. So you have something running in the session, or at least in some level of higher privileges that has access to something that sandbox apps don't. And then you have a protocol to talk to it, usually Dbus, but it could be really anything. And the way you make it safe, I mean, exactly what safe means is, is kind of up in the air. I mean, is, is it safe to allow an app to draw on your screen? Depends on what you declare to be safe. But someone has to decide what is safe and make sure that your portals are safe. And one way to do this is to have them all be interactive. Like if you have an API that's like, I want the user to select the file. And then outside of your sandbox with zero control from the app, you have a full file selection dialog and you can, you can see all your files and you can pick your file and then at the end you just send the data back to the app. Then you have a system where you, the app cannot misuse it to read random files because that would show up random file selector in the middle of nothing, and you would just cancel it, or you know, not select your important files anyway. And at the same time, if you do expect it to show up because you pick, clicked open in your app, then the fact that you select this file is probably some kind of implicit grant of access to that file. So you're using the interactive portion as, as a way to avoid having to, ahead of time, declare what's safe or not. And the other way to do safety is, is to actually have the user declare ahead of time what each app is supposed to be allowed to do. And then we have the portal actually check the calling app, is this app okay doing this? And in fact, Wayland is a portal. I mean, it was designed prior to this, but it's clearly designed from all these kinds of <coughs> rules. It's safe to expose to any, um, as long as you consider it safe to open <coughs> map windows, it's safe for a, uh, for a sandbox profession. And Pinos and Portfolio is also safe, uh, and we make them safe. <laughs> but we also have, um, XD app specific portals, and I think the most cool one is the document portal that I landed some initial work on recently. It's a way for your app to get access to files that are outside your sandbox. So basically, something on the outside of your sandbox uses this API, and it creates a document handle for a URI, and then it grants that document handle access to, uh, grants an app access to that, so you can do, events is allowed to read and write this file. And then, by the magic of views, that applicable file and nothing else is available inside the Sandbox app. So there's a views file system mounted in this directory, to run the directory, and this is the handle of the document, and that's the path name, or the uh, base name of the file. So using this, you can then update the file, read the file, and delete it if you have permissions. And it's not just a mapping of the file, it's actually an API that's safe in the sense that writes to this file will not be visible until 
you have close to file, basically. So you can, you can do atomic replace, and whatever you write will not be visible outside your sandbox until you're fully finished with that app, or with that file. So you can, for instance, do partial updates and keep a file descriptor open while some other app is reading it. You can do atomic replaces and uh, read a file. And then we have the content user portal, which is similar to what I talked about before, except the idea is that it, it has a wider sources of, of content than just files. I mean, you, you could potentially show you a webcam UI that lets you take a photo, or it could embed your photo library from some app and let you pick a photo simply. And then it runs, this all runs outside the app, and at the end you produce a, a, use the document portals to create a document for it, and we pass the handle back to the app. And that way it can uh, load it, and it's basically safe for the same reason uh, the file selector was safe. And I have like an example here. So this is a sandbox version of events, where I replace the open call to just call the portal. So this is in the sandbox, and I click this. This is outside the sandbox. And I can put some file here. And it's below there. And everything looks to the user like nothing special happened. But in fact, like I didn't fix the save as, so you can see if you try to save here. It's actually like some weird location where, where you can't see anything else. You can see the name of that particular file, but you not, don't know what directory came from. You don't know what else is in there. And uh, apparently I added a few other before. So there's a few things you can see, but not much. And in your home directory, there should be nothing. So it's empty except it has the uh, yeah, directory. So it should be safe. In some sense, I mean, it, it now has permanent access to that particular file. In some sense, you gave access to it. I think that's that's fair. Um, oh, yeah. So it's, it's easy to imagine other kinds of portals uh, we have. And one common one is the sharing portal, where you select some content and you share it, similar to what we do on Android and iOS. It will show you something that lets you pick. Do you want to share it on Twitter? Do you want to send it in an email or open with another app or things like that? And there's also like lower level stuff. You don't want the full network manager or API in the sandbox. We have a middle portal that lets you see whether you're online or not. You want to have some kind of support for printing. I'm not sure yet how that would work. Maybe we run the printout <coughs> outside. Maybe we do the queuing outside. I don't know. Um, alarms. Wake me tomorrow at 5. Open this URL. I have a geolocation. Show this in a map. Things like that. I'm, I'm sure it'll be as we start making apps work in a sandbox fashion. There'll be more and more like tiny integration features that we need to look into and, and make work. Uh, the designer have have like a page of stuff we need to do. And that's gonna be a lot of work getting that working. There's a couple of references if anyone wants to join. Uh, XD app has a mailing list, and if you want to talk about the GNOME specific stuff, that's I think that's done on GNOME OS list. Um, XDD apps on free desktop, the GNOME SDK stuff is on GNOME. Uh, that's like the main web page right now. You can find everything from there. I guess that we should move that to somewhere else sometime. I guess that was all.
Thank you. Hello. Hey. So, um, how do you uh, specify dependencies towards portals uh, from an app? So, uh, as to my understanding, the portals will be system wide. You will have like one printing portal, for example. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I install the Sandbox app, and, and uh, it will not function properly without the printing portal being installed. Yeah, I mean, sure. And, and we don't actually have an answer to that, but in, in some sense, the way I think it should work is that a particular runtime somehow implies certain portals being available. So if you if you rely on the GNOME 360 runtime, that should imply some subset of portals being available. But we don't have any explicit mapping of that. Can I just add uh, quickly? So. You didn't talk about manifest at all, so is that something coming? Do you understand what I mean? No, I'm not reading. Um, so, how do the applications specify uh, which um, services they would like to have access to? What's the format of that specification? Um, so, the metadata file is like the key value file where you can say, you can extend what like, debus things you're access to and stuff, but there's no, there's no real declarations of dependencies on the host side right now. It's not but, but for everything else, you bundle everything you need and there, there's no... It, it's not the Android model, it's the right. iOS model. When you need something, you're going to ask permission. Yeah, so, so there... Okay, so there's no plan to... Yeah, I mean, you, you could like conceivably do that yourself. on the build side. Like have some way, have some framework so that you automatically pull in your requirements when you build your app. But yeah, no, no, my question was was simpler than that. I think it was answered. Yeah. It's not the Android model where you would the user would uh, allow access to certain services when you install the applications, but rather you try to um, design the portals so that they all have user interaction. Yeah. That's the only oh, access all. control that yeah, exactly. actually happens. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Cosmo? Yes. Uh, do you have any mic bag? Do you have any idea about uh, how the UI for things like Portal will look like at the end? Because right now, like, you kind of like open a file chooser, it's not like transient to the window, yeah. it's in a different process. How would that work with Wayland? I actually have a, a thread open on, on the Wayland list for the particular case where you have one to make a process, or a different process transient to or actually some other client translated to, to a window and, and we're looking at extending Wayland to allow that basically. Yeah, I, but, I, but for the UI, I don't really, we don't really have design. I, I guess more, more generally, like in, when, when you use like iOS, I feel that those dialogues are um, OS dialogues. Like you can see that they're not part of the app. So there's kind of like a fundamental, like a philosophical distinction if you want. Yeah, I don't think we want that though. Because that's very like, you're only been running a single app kind of thing. It's not your traditional desktop where you have multiple windows open and they all run in parallel. I don't know. Ask Alan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have we have a fight tomorrow at Dolan. <laughs> Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, yeah. The first one is about network access. Uh, you mentioned that you have either no access right now or full access. Yeah. So what's the, is there a plan for partial access, like only these ports? I mean, it's certainly possible with the network namespaces to do more complicated <coughs> setups, but they are more complicated. You certainly have to have a firewall that interacts with a system firewall, and you have to have routing, and becomes disconnected from the uh, the host network status so that you think you're always online because your local link is always online. So yeah, I don't have any good answers. I wish there were a better way to do it, but I think right now 
practically, that's the only thing, thing we can do. Um, my second question is, are we talking about access to files through portals? You mentioned it done through um, Fuse. Um, so, how does that work exactly? Do you write to a separate file and do it a domain name? Or, like, because I'm wondering, because some applications require, say, mapping of files, or yeah. write, large, write, write large files in multimedia applications? Yeah, so, so it's a Fuse of file system. It, it does allow you to write a file next to it and then do a term replace, or you can open a file, truncate it, and write. But you can't do in place writes without a truncate. Right, so I think like um, browsers and a lot of applications use SQLite, for instance. SQLite requires special access to the file. If you can't do it in omic rename, etc. Sure. Yeah, sure. But, but the idea is that the document portal is for documents. Yeah. Like your internal SQLite database would not be a document, it would be stored in your per app writable storage as any regular file. Uh, yeah, I think there was more to add before. Thanks for your presentation on this very interesting thing. It looks promising. I had a question with. It looks to me like some of the goals are similar to the one of kernel security drivers like Apamo, but I didn't really understand if it's linked to kernel security drivers or if it uses a totally different approach. And if you use a totally different approach, why you thought it would be better or more relevant? Well, I mean, the kernel security is. is Generally, on the level of uh, UID, this URL cannot read this. this URL, and, and a GNOME session kind of breaks if you start having every process run as a different UID. So I don't see there is any way we could use it without like, heavily modifying what kind of security it does. I mean, potentially you could use as a Linux context for every binary, but I, I really don't really see a way to seem to use the current security kernel extensions. It's possible to kind of sandbox uh, an application, a desktop application using uh, Apamo. It down intakes for the top browser, for example. Okay. I'm not sure it's the best approach. Mm -hmm. I think the one you're presenting looks more easy to apply to lots of different applications, but it's possible. It's certainly possible to use all sorts of kernel stuff, but having existing apps mostly work without lots of changes, I think it's hard. It all looks good. I mean, Chrome does all sorts of weird stuff when it sandbox itself. But there was like a lot of work making that work. If you want to take any existing app and just run it, I don't think we can rely on that kind of customized work. So um, is the plan that when you build one of these sandbox applications and then it would run um, directly on Ubuntu or SUSE or Debian or Fedora or whatever, or do you have to compile it on, on each one of those? No, 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 it should work, it should work. I mean, I tried to make a no app <coughs> and run it on Ubuntu and Fedora, and it works fine. I mean, they're, they're, depending on how much you expose of your host system, the more you expose, the more you risk that things are incompatible. Um, so if you expose your home directory and you have some weird config file that doesn't really match what the uh, runtime has for, for, some, for some version of your app, you could run into problem, but then in practice it seemed to work pretty well. Okay, I think that's probably all we have time for in this session because the break's supposed to start, so that just leaves us with uh, a speaker's gift, which uh, you're going to be given now. So this is just a gift that all speakers are going to get. Uh, it's some uh, tasty, uh, tasty licorice. Thanks. Thanks.
I think he's taking care of the guy. He's handling the camera. Oh, okay. He knows. <laughs> no, but we have new cards now. Okay. Okay, and um, press stop here.